Thank you very much. So without wasting much time, I'll just go straight to present our research work, the findings of our research work on the topic, knowledge and perceived effects of female genital mutilation among women of childbearing age, attending a comprehensive healthcare facility in Enugu, Southeast Nigeria. So by way of introduction, I can say that female genital mutilation or cutting, as some people will call it, is a major health problem with numerous consequences. When you talk about female genital mutilation, it is the cutting or removal of the external female genitalia you know, without any medical justification or even the consent from the individuals that are involved. So in some communities, it is commonly referred to as female circumcision as it normalizes the practice of drawing parallels with male circumcision without really distinguishing a serious physical and psychological harm. Going by the next slide, Studies globally have shown that approximately 3 million girls and women are at risk of female genital mutilation or cutting. And this actually exposes them to potential negative health consequences. So female genital mutilation or cutting, it represents an illegal practice in many jurisdictions and is a violation of women and girls' human rights. To some authors, they say that human, uh, female genital mutilation is the practice whose origin and significance is shrouded in secrecy, uncertainty, and even confusion. Now, um, regrettably, despite all the efforts by World Health Organizations, and other governmental and non-governmental organizations in order to discourage the practice of female genital mutilation and cutting. It is still practiced in many countries of the world and most prevalent is in Africa, while the practice is still flourishing in some communities in the Enugu State, Nigeria. So from the next slide, we we'll also see that the practice of female genital mutilation is usually carried out on the eighth day after birth. And this actually coincides with the child's you know, naming ceremony, which is a festive event that comes in with a lot of gifts, a lot of refreshments. But for the poor mothers, you know, who could not really openly resist their girl's child to be circumcised, it will really mean that there is no naming ceremony for them. Then to some other individuals, it is usually seen as a source of you know, personal income, especially for the elderly female members of the community. Even the babas, the traditional healers, um, the best attendants, because they are the people that usually carry out the procedure. So from the next slide, the big question now is, are women of childbearing age in this locality knowledgeable about female genital cutting or mutilation? What are their perceived effects of these practices? And then what are the likely factors that might influence their practice of female genital mutilation or cutting? Now, the next slide shows us that there is depth of documented studies on female and um, on this particular study in Enugu State, thus the need for the study to assess the knowledge and perceived effects of female genital mutilation or cutting among these women attending this comprehensive health facility in Enugu South East Nigeria. The next slide shows us the specific objective that enabled us to arrive at a result or as the measure uh, aim. And these are to ascertain their knowledge to determine their perceived effects, ascertain the cultural factors, and also the social factors that might 
influence the practice of female genital mutilation or cutting. Now, for this next slide, is the, it shows us the methodology that was used in carrying out the study. So the design was a cross-sectional survey design, which was adopted in a total population of 240 women of childbearing age that attends the antenatal clinic of Owani Cottage Hospital in Ugo State. Actually, the study was a total population study. No sampling was done because of the smallness of the population. So the whole population was used. And the inclusion criteria, going by the next slide, shows that, that women who had delivery within the last five years were used. And then they were between the ages of 15, um, 18 to 49 years, and they were residents in that area for one year or even more with unquest consent. So they showed willingness to participate in the study. So in the next slide, we saw the instrument and participant recruitment. So the instrument for the data collection was validated researchers developed questionnaires and ethical approval was got from ethics and research committee of University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital in Tukwazala in Enugu State. Informed consent and anonymity of participants we had done prior to the data collection. And these child-bearing women, they were recruited through the help of three research assistants. The next slide shows us the data collection. So explanations on purpose of the study and the role of the participants we had done prior to the consent and instruments administration. And then data we are collected by face-to-face, one-on-one contacts with the participants during the antenatal clinic from 9th April to 10th June 2021. And the data collection exercise lasted for approximately eight weeks. Now for the data analysis, data was analyzed descriptively using uh, frequency, percentages, mean and standard deviation. That's for the continuous variables. Then the test of association of demographic variables, we are done using an inferential statistics of chi-square. Um, probability value less than 0.05 was considered scientifically significant. So all these analyses we are done with the aid of IBM SSP SPSS version 20. The next slide shows the results of measure findings. So for the results of measure finding, the participants we are really within the age range of 17 to 45 years with the mean and standard age deviation of 29.07 plus minus 6.39. Um, majority of them we are, that is the 79.7% we are married and they were predominantly Christians. Then for the... Um, their knowledge about uh, uh, concept of female genital mutilation, 77.5 of them had good knowledge of the concept. Then mostly perceived effects by the participants included genital tissue damage, urinary tract infection, that's UTI, and then reproductive tract infections, post-traumatic stress disorders and painful misturation. So these were the major findings, you know, as per their perceived effects of female genital mutilation or cutting. And then the most influencing social factors that were identified by the participants were um, rights of passage to adulthood, which was identified by 3.05 plus minus 1.09 uh, participants. Then another important one was sense of belonging to an ethnic group and then social acceptance. Actually, these findings, we are still in consonance with the studies that were carried out by some other authors like one 2019 that shows almost exactly the same findings 
Why the cultural factors we are safeguarding virginity before marriage, you know, decreasing promiscuity and then promoting marriageability. But it, uh, it's also disagreed, but this particular findings, it disagreed with the findings of one of that's 2019, because one told us that even those of them that we are circumcised, I mean, those of them that had a female uh, genital mutilation, you know, there are people saying it's because of their, it should reduce promiscuity amongst them. But they observed that those of them that were circumcised, they were even more promiscuous than those that did not receive the circumcision. And then another major finding is that there was significant association between knowledge, ethnic group, religion, and then level of education. They all have significant association with the knowledge of um, female genital mutilation. So in conclusion, we say that actually the participants had good knowledge, but there were some factors, especially social cultural factors that influence their practice of female genital cutting. Now, based on these findings, it underscores the need for creating more awareness within the community about the health consequences of female genital mutilation and cutting, because some of them we claim that they are not even aware of such. Then galvanizing support to end this practice is the key. They needed our support. Then as healthcare providers, being nurses, and we nurses, we serve, you know, we are the major workforce within the society or within the health sector. So we together with the non-governmental and governmental agencies, we need to work with these women and even the stakeholders within the communities in order to openly discuss it because we want our voices to be heard. Nurses being advocates to some of these things. It will go a long way to reducing mortality and morbidity that is associated with female genital mutilation. And then we also need to let our men know, let the males get involved into the business because they are the ones that community members listen to. They are still part of the stakeholders that will put their mouths or put their voices together in order to end this. Now, it's also suggested that a qualitative study should be done in order to explore the lived experiences of the girls and women with female genital cutting or mutilation within this setting. There is need for us to save our girls from breaking the results in order to let them live. Thank you very much for listening. Do we have an idea what the perception and attitude of the nurses are on the female mutilation? Do you have, in the course of your research or review, did you find anything that talks about the attitude of the nurses towards female um, mutilation, genital mutilation? Um, thank you very much for that question. Well, in the course of searching the literature for this study, there were quite some studies that we had done on their attitude, but not in Inugu states. So when you look at some of these studies that we had done outside, you know, a greater number of them had positive attitude towards um, female genital mutilation. Invariably, they say that they don't want it. And many of them, or, or some areas, let me be precise, in some areas like Ebony States, where we find out that even some nurses had it done on themselves. I mean, when they were, some of them, when they were still young, the, the procedure was carried out on them and they say it was norm for them. Whilst other individuals, they will, they will tell you that now they have no the right thing to be done. They should not advocate for risk. So actually, 
many nurses have positive attitude concerning it. Okay. All right. For the person that so has that question, for the person that has that question, you can see there are likely variable uh, opinions or perception of the nurse's attitude towards female gen uh, genital mutilation. Another question for you also, Dr. Chikodli, is what what is our are the healthcare providers in Enugu, Nigeria, doing to end these ugly practices? Before you answer that question, I want to say that this is going to be a collaborative effort. It's not going to be one effort yeah. for one person. It's not just going to be healthcare providers only. We're going to come together just like a research finder that the men has to be part of this uh, journey. The women has to be part of it. The congregation, the community is going to be a collaborative effort for us to end this practice because it has a lot of negative implication based on what she presented here today. But let's hear from what Dr. Chikotli have to say. Okay. Thank you once again for your question. Um, I think your question is whether nurses in Enugu, they are doing something about um, the female genital mutilation. Actually, yes. yes. What, what is the healthcare providers doing to end the ugly practice? Yes, because some of them realize the implication or the health consequences of this female genital mutilation, especially for those of them that work Work in the maternity section, you know, seeing clients coming in with prolonged labor, sometimes prolonged obstructed labor, and sometimes women also complain about um, having fistulas and what have you. So there was a time uh, they rose up a campaign against such in various communities which involve even some stakeholders in the community. And they were meant to understand that this is not something that they can do alone. That those of them that are stakeholders in the community, the, the women leaders, the, uh, the men in particular, you know, since they are going to be involved in the whole thing, when they speak to the other women, because this, uh, these injuries or these procedures are mainly carried out by women. So you can imagine women inflicting such injuries on fellow women. I mean, it's not appropriate. So we talk to the um, women leaders through the various religious group, you know, during their August meetings to see how we can put an end to this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. I appreciate you responding to that. That also answers the question somebody is asking, what is the opinion of the traditional and community leaders? And she also alluded to that when she's responding. And uh, somebody suggested that a qualitative research needs to be done to understand their perception. And I agree on that. We all have to come together. I, up to until now, I thought that this practice has ended. I didn't know that these practices are still ongoing. Education, 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 Dr. Goji said that. That is education is evident that education and training is the number one step in the framework of disease prevention. Is, is the framework for unsafe practices is the framework to change and modify behavior. If behavior does not change and it carried from generation to generation, it continues to permeate into our community. Sometimes it doesn't even allow to apply the knowledge that we have gotten, but we have to come together to be able to end this. Let's see if there are any other questions. Um, are there laws against genital mutilation in Nigeria? If not, then, laws should be united to prevent these harmful practices. Um, Dr. Chikotli, in the course of your research, did you find if there is any law in Nigeria uh, against or any policy related to 
genital mutilation? Any current policy or law? Yes, in 2015, during the, uh, the time of President Goodluck Jonathan, there was a law that was enacted you know, violence, it was just included in violence against women and I think and children. So female genital mutilation was included in that particular law. But the problem with Nigeria is its implementation. And actually many people are not really aware of such laws in the country. In fact, from the, after that, we lost Jonathan, whatever, it just went off like that. But that, actually, there was a law that was enacted during a president, we lost Jonathan's regime. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes, all of us know there's always laws, some policies. And that is what the ION is calling us to do what? To engage in policy development, in policy implementation. Nurses, we have over 100 doctors sitting down in this conference. They are calling you, let's go to the table to enact these policies, to help them implement these policies. And recently it's been shown that when nurses are consultant, when nurses are on the table, they make a change that people could not do for the last 10 years. So I want to appreciate Dr. Chico.